Good morning, everyone. It's great to see an overflowing room uh, to be talking about uh, Social Security. Um, my focus today, I think uh, the problem going third is that sometimes what you have to say has been said before, but there's also value in saying it similar things in a different way. Um, my focus is on three aspects of Social Security. It's finances, it's affordability, and it's adequacy. I'm with the National Academy of Social Insurance, and our mission is to promote understanding of how social insurance contributes to both economic security and a vibrant economy. The first thing that's important to recognize about Social Security and its finances is unlike almost every other federal program, the, long -term, the short term in Social Security is 10 years. In most other programs, that's the long term. But here, Social Security's short term is 10 years, its long term is 75 years. And there is created an expectation that for the system to be in balance, it should be in balance both for 10 years and for 75 years. That's a big test. Um, next important thing about Social Security is who pays for it. Um, both, and it's important to recognize that this is not it's easier to think about this as in terms of people pay, people receive. It's not just a government program. Workers and employers pay, and they pay equal amounts, 6.2% of earnings up to a tax cap, which is this year $106,800. That was the lion's share of revenue for Social Security last year, 83% of the money coming in. Another set of payers are uh, upper income beneficiaries who pay income taxes on their Social Security benefit income, and part of that money also goes to Social Security. Last year it was 3% of revenue. The other important source of revenue is interest on the reserves, the Social Security surpluses that are invested in Treasury securities. That interest income was 14% last year, a non-trivial addition to Social Security income. Um, in terms of finances, uh, Social Security is now running a surplus, and it has been running a surplus on an annual basis for about 20 years. Um, in two, in uh, last year, it was projected in the trustees' report to have an income of about $820 billion. It's a big program. Uh, the outgo was $623 billion, leaving a surplus of $186 billion. And that surplus then, as mentioned, is invested in Treasury securities. It's available to pay future benefits, and it earns interest. Okay, taking the 75-year outlook for Social Security, and the trustees offer three different scenarios for, their, for the outlook. This one is their so-called best estimate or middle scenario. Social Security surplus is expected to continue through uh, 2026, from 2009 through 2026, about 27 more years. That is, revenue plus interest on the reserves will exceed what is paid out. The reserves will um, uh, accumulate to about $5.5 trillion. Again, these used to be unfathomable numbers until we had a meltdown. But these are <laughs> they're big numbers because it's a big program and it serves a lot of people. After 2026, the reserves will gradually be drawn down to help pay for benefits because the money coming in plus the interest is not quite enough to continue to pay benefits. By 2041, the reserves will be depleted. Then new money coming in would cover only 78% of the cost according to this best estimate scenario. And under the law, benefits cannot be paid uh, beyond that amount. If nothing happens, there would be an, a, uh, a ratchet down in, um, in benefit payments. But of course, a lot can happen between now and then, including a change in the forecast and including uh, action by policymakers to either uh, fix the revenue or, or reduce the benefit obligations. Also important to notice, know that this, um, this shortfall could happen sooner, and it could happen never. And under the trustees' high-cost scenario, reserves will be depleted 10 years earlier, in 2031. Under their low-cost scenario, the system is adequately financed for 75 years and beyond. This is an ultimately a, a, an acknowledgment of the sheer 
unpredictability of the future. But this range of estimates gives us a sense of, of probabilities about how quickly we need to act and the magnitude of the action that's needed. Shifting from finances to the question of affordability. Will we be able to afford Social Security when boomers retire? And Henry has alluded to this, as did Mrs. Canelli. But as, as boomers retire, there will be a significant growth in the share of the population who are 65 and older, projected to rise from about 13% today to about 20% by 2030. But how much does that raise the cost of Social Security? Well, the best way to think about that, and that's, this has been mentioned before, is Social Security total benefit payments as a share of the entire economy or gross domestic product, that's GDP. Today, benefits are about 4.3% of the economy, and that is projected to rise to about 6.1% by 2035. That's a 1.8 percentage point increase in the share of the economy for Social Security. Then, according to the best estimate scenario, uh, the system will decline slightly as a share of GDP back to 5.8 percent. But that, that increase is 1.8 percent of the total economy. Is that a big deal? Well, if history is a guide, uh, the answer is probably no. Um, we can't afford it. Uh, certainly, the increase in spending for national security in just the last seven years, 2001 through 2008, was 2.0 percent. That was just seven years, not 25 years. Another way to think about affordability when we're talking about the baby boom is how did things change when they were children? Back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, there was unprecedented demand to increase spending for public education. These baby boomers showed up kind of by surprise in, at kindergarten saying, okay, where's my teacher? Um, and towns, uh, counties, states, and the federal government had to respond quickly. And they did. And spending for public education grew by a total of 2.8 percentage points between 1950 and 1975, that 25-year period when boomers were showing up uh, needing to be educated. Well, the fact that there, that was a surprise. That kind of took the country by surprise, this, this um, baby boom. But it is not a surprise that these boomers um, are growing older and they're, they're, the boomers are fully reflected in the long range forecasts of Social Security and have been for a long time. Shifting from this affordability to do we need to worry about the adequacy of Social Security? And as Barbara pointed out and as others have said, we haven't heard much about adequacy of Social Security lately. We hear about the need for entitlement reform. We hear about the need to rein in spending. But it's also important to think about what is the point of this program? What is its purpose? And is it achieving that purpose of delivering basic adequacy of income to seniors and to families? Reasons why we might want to think about this are because Social Security is such an important part of income of elders, the benefits, as others have said, are relatively modest. Replacement rates are declining. It will be less adequate relative to prior standards of living in the future than it has been in the past. And other sources of income for seniors and families are less secure. We'll go over each of those uh, briefly.